In my growing up years when my knees were good, my spirit and flesh were willing and my sense of mortality had not really kicked in. One of my favorite things was to explore the cliffs and canyons in Missouri. There are lots of them. For example, over 200 cliffs, if you want to know. I was thinking of this because of the youth trip to uh, Starved Rock last week. And my youthful enthusiasm at that time allowed me to explore and take little notice of the danger that existed being so close to the edge of a cliff. And my logic was that if I fell, I really knew how to swim, so there was really no problem at all. Countless falls, trips to the emergency room, and broken bones later, and really great stories that I will never, ever share with my son, finally did knock brain cells loose so that I stopped doing these things and my mind began to function. And I started to wonder things like, how did something so majestic and powerful and beautiful end up just hiding out in the middle of like a forested area. You see, the forest and the hills and the trees and all of these things were wonderful enough and beautiful. But then you would reach this spot where the earth just drops off. So how did that happen? And when you first see it, that might not be your question. You're probably just overcome by the beauty, the power of this thing before you. You might see just this waterfall running down or water running through, or it might just be totally dry until the spring rains come and then it's not dry at all. Or maybe you're staring at the tree that grows straight out of the cliff and it's holding on for dear life. Yet, that thing is really strong enough to hold a bunch of teenagers that'll climb out on it just for a picture. Yet again, do not tell my son those stories. So, this beautiful canyon, how did it come to be? Well, the answer's really complex, but no, not so much. You see, the rocks suffered. They got hurt, they got beat up. And more often than not, the bully was water, teaming up with weather. And of course, they had time on their side. Thank you, Mick Jagger. The innocent little landscape there with the rock bed experienced the suffering we will call rainfall, and water gets into the cracks and crevices, and weather changes, so the water freezes and expands and splits the rocks, and weather changes again, and water goes deeper into the cracks, and, well, edges break off, and erosion is just real, right? And so is tectonic activity, right? And these things just keep happening the weather and the weathering and the melting and the shifting and the expanding and the contracting and the eroding and, well, back and forth over time. Streams or creeks or things that really do feel like rivers in the spring happen. Weather is persistent. The only thing more persistent is time. And they work together through the storms and the pressure and the mud and the muck and the cracking. They work with the hands of our Creator to make something so deep and beautiful. It's the way nature works. This is how things are. There are storms and the changing of seasons and the consistency of this creates something amazing to behold. That's the same way our Christian life works, too. It'd be great if it didn't but that's how things are. The consistency of God is amazing to behold. 
The book of James teaches us some things about this. He says that suffering, the pressure, the cracking, the mud, and the muck of life creates something beautiful. As we wrestle with it, wrestle with our faith and with God, we can get a hold of something amazing. There will be pain and suffering in our life. James is very clear about this. These things are going to fall like rain, like the rain that falls on the just and the unjust. Thank you, Matthew 5, verse 45. No matter who you are, it's just going to happen, and there's no avoiding it. But for James, the first and main point out of the gate is that suffering in life, and while no one can avoid it, what we have to do is consider it pure joy. Our suffering is the foundation of a beautiful, deep, and mature faith. In fact, the only way to achieve a deep and mature faith is through suffering. Now, let's be honest here. I understand with this as the premise why the epistle of James is not often read or preached on. May I get an amen? There it is. If this is the main point, no wonder we try to avoid it. I want to be honest. We don't like to suffer. We want to skip the bad stuff. The Stones released Mother's Little Helper in 1966, and we all bought it because we agreed the premise. An unlikely backup to the Stones was Carly Simon, reminding us that she didn't have time for the pain, she didn't have room for the pain. And that was 1974. And because we're in a sacred place, I shall not forget Madonna, who told us that pain is a warning that something is wrong. That was 1998. So no matter which generation you might find yourself in, we agree. We don't like pain or suffering. We do not like it, Sam, I am, but we must confess it's true. We cannot dodge it. So James chapter 1, verse 2 begins this way, and I'm using a transliteral kind of translation. Reckon it nothing but joy, my brethren, whether you find yourself hedged in by various trials. Be assured that the trying of your faith leads to power of endurance or works within you toward patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, deficient in nothing. I love that opening. Reckon it to nothing or consider it pure joy when you suffer. Consider it pure joy. It does not say, be happy about your suffering. That would be like the worst theology ever. It says, consider it, reckon it, nothing but pure joy. No one's asking us to be happy about suffering. No one wants to be happy or wants us to be happy about being in pain or if we get bad news or if life is miserable. The word is reckon or to process, to think through, work through, spiritually engage in wrestling with something that is happening. And the scripture says then, that we wrestle as pure joy, which is a state of being. Joy is something that takes hold of you. It's in you, of you, grips you, becomes then your very strength. And if you have strength, you possess that. It's not just being excited, woohoo, something's going to happen, I am happy. That's fleeting. Joy is something that is unshakable. So even if the earth shakes and trembles, joy is solid. James verse one, sorry, chapter one, verse two. Consider it pure joy. But as you consider it, notice what it doesn't say. 
It doesn't say how long the process of consideration is going to take. We who were raised on Sesame Street and now use Instagram might be pre-wired to think that a period of consideration might take as long as, say, reading the epistle. It's five whole chapters. If I consider it for five whole chapters, I'll have it. And if I have a busy day, I'll read three. I can be semi-content. I'll read the other two tomorrow, and then I'm gold, right? But this reckoning thing and this considering process in faith, it's not placed in Kronos time. And James knows that because he's a realist. Our God is a God of Kairos time. And we will only know when we're walking with God. And God will only know when we're ready to move forward, when we're steady in our moving forward. When our endurance and patience have chipped off those sharp edges, eroded away what needs to go, and then it's time because we're steady. We're not puffed up in our prosperity and we're not cast down in our adversity. We're able to approach life evenly. We can suffer with those who suffer and rejoice with those who rejoice. In the right time, Kairos time, God's time. You see, no timer went off when the dinosaur age was over. And the ice age began. No timer goes off. Boop. It's time to move forward now. The only real question is, are we in this ice age that's like 2.5 million years, or is this really an ice age that began 40 million years ago? And it, these are big question things, and we don't know. We just read this stuff. It's Kairos time. And the wisdom of God and nature are with us as we figure it out. We'd like to set our watch, but we can't. You see, as the summer ends, and we've harvested much, those of us who had gardens at least, those of us who didn't, well, we bought stuff at the grocery store, right? And we'd like to say, well, shoot, here it is, it was easy. We tilled the soil, we planted, we watered, and there it is, right? That's how it happened. Except, you know, we tilled, we planted, we watered, we waited. We weeded. We watered, we waited, we weeded. We watered, we waited, we weeded, we waited, we watered, we weeded, we waited, we watered, we weeded, we waited, right? Or we just went to the grocery store because who has time for that nonsense, right? But you get the picture. We are continually moving forward. These things are happening and we will not get stuck and God will not let us get stuck in the mud and the muck and the mire, in the suffering and the sadness and the junk and the messiness. It is the process of enduring and God is with us in this persistence of time moving forward. And what we are offered is the chance to consider and find joy in the midst of the trials, in the mud and the weeds that perseverance, the maturing, which is just a kind way of saying, as you age. God is always moving us forward. And as God moves us forward, moving us into, say, verses 6 and 7, it says that as we are producing with God endurance, maturity, and faith, if we're lacking wisdom, we should ask, ask, but never doubt. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed, the doubter being double-minded and unstable. Who heard that and said, ouch? Maybe it was just me. James was written in Greek. In Greek, the word for faith contains the very essence, the concept of what we call doubt 
within the word. Faith in Greek is best defined as doubting, but moving forward as if it's true anyway. You live into it. Faith is an action verb. You question, you doubt, but you live it into being anyway. We don't translate the word faith that way, do we? More's the pity. So when you have faith, hear it that way, and the text says, ask in faith, never doubting. Doubting, the theo, translates this way, a divided heart, vacillating. So, faith, living into it, but wanting to have your cake and eat it too, or, since this is what we're talking about, in Greek, a better way, I have a foot in a canoe, and the other foot in a kayak. How steady am I going to be on the water? Now I'm tossed to and fro in the sea. Do you want to say, you betcha, buckwheat? You have faith moving forward with doubt, but still living into it. Never trying to move forward with a foot in two separate canoes. That's common sense, right? That's more of what that means. So when you enter into prayer, you can enter into it saying, help me, I doubt that this is real. I don't have a clue. That's an okay prayer. You're asking for God's wisdom. That just means you know you're not in charge. And that's okay. It's tricky. And you want God's wisdom and you're humble enough to ask for it. And as you move forward in this text, you are given the nugget from verse 13 through 15. No one when tempted should say, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself tempts no one. No one is tempted by his own. Okay, this is a text that just straight comes out and says, those struggles that we have, the pain, the suffering, God is not doing it to you. God is not tempting us or testing us. God is with us as we endure, as we persevere, as we seek wisdom and guidance. God is with us as we are faithing into being. God is with us. And truly, whether we're on a majestic mountaintop or dangerously hanging over a cliff, God is persistently with us. And no matter what Mick and the boys may say, time is not on our side. Time is on God's side. So let us consider it pure joy as we go through time with God. Amen.